Yeah, good morning, everyone. As you all know, we have had toric lenses for almost a decade now, more than that. And today, it's not even a debate that if a patient undergoing cataract surgery has significant and regular corneal astigmatism, then in order to achieve emetropia for this patient, trying to treat this astigmatism at the IOL plane with a toric lens is perhaps the most safe, effective, and predictable treatment that we have for our patients today. Given the fact that the incidence of corneal astigmatism is almost 30 percent, one in every three patients has significant corneal astigmatism uh, in, the, in our cataract population, and hence I think more and more now, use of toric lenses are becoming a part of standard of care of cataract practice rather than a lens that is only offered to a select few. And despite all this experience, we still come across situations where we are faced with a dilemma as to whether a toric lens would be appropriate for this particular kind of eye or this particular kind of patient or not. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you some of the cases that we have learned a lot from. The first patient that I'd like to share with you was this middle-aged lady. She came to us with a complaint of blurred vision in both her eyes, despite the fact that she had undergone cataract surgery in her right eye a year ago elsewhere. As you can notice here, she has a significant residual refractive error, and to be specific, it is an astigmatic error. <clears throat> when I looked at her slit lamp, it was this peaked pupil, which actually made me curious as to what was going on inside. So when I dilated this eye, what I find is that there is a posterior capsule dehiscence, and then there is an IOL in the sulcus. But most importantly, this lens in the sulcus is a toric lens. So what we have here is a decentered toric lens in the sulcus. When we evaluated the eye for cataract surgery, the left eye of this patient, and I'm going to be using a lot of aberrometry images because they have a very important and easy to understand way in an objective format where I can actually explain as to how the toric lens is actually behaving inside the eye. So as you can see here on aberrometry, preoperatively, this is the corneal astigmatism, the blue bar that you're seeing here, and that is what this patient has in her left eye, the eye that we are going to be operating. So now the situation is that this patient has significant corneal astigmatism in one eye, and the previously operated eye has a significant residual refractive error. So what would I do? Would I put a monofocal lens and give her glasses for both the eyes, ask her to use glasses all day for far and near? Or would I try to achieve emetropia in the second eye by putting a toric lens? In all these many years of experience, we have come to this firm conclusion that we must try to achieve emetropia in the second eye in order to reduce the dependence on glasses for these patients. Oftentimes, we are talking about people who are going to get more older and elderly. So why not try to achieve emetropia in the second eye? We explained this perspective to this patient, and fortunately, she went ahead with a toric lens, which, as you can see here, is well-centered in the back postoperatively. Now, before I show you the visual outcome, take a look at this post-operative eye, eye trace image. What you're seeing here is the corneal astigmatism, and that astigmatism is completely corrected by the toric lens inside the eye. As a result, what you're seeing is absolutely zero astigmatic error left behind. And true enough, the patient's unaided vision is excellent. The patient is extremely happy, especially with her binocular unaided vision. So I think the whole idea of reducing dependence by correcting astigmatism, at least in one eye, is the point that I'm trying to make here. So the important lesson is that even if one eye has a residual refractive error, we must try to achieve emetropia in the second eye. Another very important lesson learned is that if for whatever reasons, if the capsular bag is not intact, if you have a PCR, then we must abort the plan for a toric lens and not implant a toric lens in the sulcus, because when implanted like that, it will not only not do its job, but it will induce astigmatism and induce other higher order aberrations, which would further reduce the quality of vision for the patient. So if we have a PCR, then let's just go ahead and implant a monofocal lens in the sulcus. My second patient is somebody who had a dense corneal opacity in one eye, so essentially a one-eyed patient, who came to us for cataract surgery of his left eye, but that eye also had multiple corneal opacities. On preoperative evaluation, we find that he has a significant amount of corneal astigmatism, but ranging in diapters from four diapters to six diapters of corneal astigmatism. Also, there is varying axis, and I'm sure that all of us present in the hall today have faced this situation many times where you are having a patient who has varying magnitude and axis, and then you are left with a confusion as to which one should you actually treat as correct, whether I should treat the four diapters or the six diapters or what, which axis is correct. In this particular patient, specifically, because he had multiple corneal opacities, it is very important to understand the pupillary area. 
The cornea overlying the pupillary area is the cornea that he is actually going to use. So evaluating this patient in a mesopic pupil becomes very important. Fortunately for him, the mesopic area of the pupil, the cornea overlying that is free of corneal opacity. But the next question is that is the corneal astigmatism over this mesopic pupil, is it regular or not? So we must evaluate the topography and what we find is that fortunately he has a regular corneal astigmatism in the pupillary area. So we advise him to undergo a toric lens implantation and we put a T9. Post-operatively this patient, because the pupil and the cornea overlying the pupil are not affected by the opacities, patient has an excellent unaided vision. So a very important lesson is that if the pupillary area, the cornea overlying that portion, if that has regular corneal astigmatism, then we may go ahead and implant a toric lens because it's very important to implant a toric lens only when you are addressing a regular corneal astigmatism and not an irregular one. Secondly, if we ever have a doubt about magnitude, if you have more than one instrument on which you are evaluating the cornea, if you have a varying magnitude, then opting for the optical keratometers make a lot of sense because they are measuring more points on the cornea and they are measuring closer to the center. Most of our pupils actually don't dilate a whole lot. So the closer to the center of the cornea is what we are actually interested in. And if you are ever in doubt about the axis, then topography is what gives you a more accurate uh, axis for that astigmatism. The final patient I'd like to share with you is a very interesting case. A young female, 38-year-old, who is an HR executive and is, you know, mostly working on the computer all day long. She came to us with a complaint of severe glare whenever she is faced with bright light at night blurred vision in both her eyes and she also has a history of having undergone cataract surgery elsewhere about two years ago. Now this patient actually knows that she has a multifocal lens in the previously operated eye and true enough she does have a multifocal lens but very specifically this patient is extremely unhappy with multifocal lens. She is very clear that all her complaints of glare and blurred vision are because of multifocal lens because that is what she has read on the internet and that is what she has been told by a lot of people. So she came to us with a very clear thing that I do not want a multifocal in my second eye. When she was so vehement about it, we were curious as to what is actually going on in that previously operated eye. Again, resorting to the abrometry images, what we found was that there were no internal aberrations. So in this particular patient, the multifocal lens is totally innocent. It is not inducing any glare, nothing. What was actually the problem was that the cornea had significant astigmatism to the tune of two diopters, and all of this astigmatism was left behind uncorrected. Specific thing about uncorrected astigmatism is that whenever you are faced with bright lights in this situation, it will induce a starburst kind of phenomenon that the patient will report as glare. So that was actually what was the problem in her eye and not the multifocal lens. To show you how it was happening, this is the corneal astigmatism that is actually contributing to the total eye and she actually requires almost two diopters of cylindrical correction to give her a crisp good vision for far. To give you another example, the abrometry also has a, a facet where you can see it in a simulated vision format. So it is this blur in the cornea which is actually causing the total blur. It's not the lens. When we evaluated the second eye, the eye that we were going to be operating, that eye also had a significant corneal astigmatism. Otherwise, her eye was suitable for a multifocal lens. But we are talking about a patient who is extremely negative about multifocal lenses. So we explained to her that she also has the option of opting for a toric monofocal lens, but then she would have to use glasses for working on the laptop or for near. But then we sat her down, we actually showed her all the eye trace images, we explained how multifocal lens was actually not the fault, and we explained to her that we may want to consider putting a multifocal toric lens with a low diopter ad. The ad that kind of gives you good vision for far and intermediate, so would address her requirements for laptop working. She may have to selectively use glasses because of the other eye, and with all of this information, we asked her to think about it and take a decision. Finally, she chose to opt for a multifocal toric lens because she herself was actually motivated to not have to use glasses all the time. So she opted for a multifocal toric lens and that's what we went ahead with. And fortunately, an excellent result. Patient is very happy with the unaided performance of that eye. To show you how it actually looked on the abrometry, this is post-operative, the corneal astigmatism, totally compensated by the multifocal toric lens, giving the kind of visual outcome that the patient appreciates. 
Very importantly, the binocular unaided vision is something that will allow her to perform a lot of her activities without constantly having to reach out for glasses. So finally, in summary, what I would say is that in such patients, whenever a patient comes with a multifocal lens, it is not proper to assume automatically that it's a multifocal design that's at fault. Oftentimes, it's the uncorrected astigmatism. And whenever we are planning to offer a multifocal lens, we must evaluate this eye very carefully for astigmatism and make sure that we correct as much astigmatism as is possible. In summary, I would say that whenever you are faced with a dilemma for corneal astigmatism or for a toric lens, remembering some of these very important principles would help you out. Making sure that we are very precise in our astigmatic evaluation, not just for the magnitude and axis, but also regularity. That's very important. Oftentimes in the pupillary area, that's our area of interest. Making sure that you have the correct formulation of the lens. So not just the correct toricity, that is T3, T4, T5, but the correct spherical equivalent becomes very important. So using the right IOL calculation formulas are extremely important when you are using lenses like multifocals or torics. And finally, making sure that we have implanted it in the capsular bag well aligned to the intended axis. If we follow all of these principles, then we can come across and overcome all of the obstacles that you may find in your practice today. Thank you all very much.